looking good today. Yeah. I, I pull bald off. Let's just let's go with that. I don't know that I have <laughs> nice hair, <laughs> but I do make bald work for me. Um, Michael, excited to have you in the studio today. We we typically start by having you tell us a little bit about you personally, and I know a bit of your story. Uh, you know, your parents are refugees, that sort of thing. So we'd love to hear the personal side of Michael before we jump into the business side, if you're okay with that. Yeah, yeah, well, that's great. Um, I was born and raised here in Tempe, Arizona, and my parents were refugees from Cambodia. They came over in the early 80s. I was born shortly after they arrived. Um, grew up here. I tell people I went to the three M's of school. I went to Meyer Elementary um, um, McCamey uh, Middle School and McClintock High School, all here in Tempe, Arizona. Graduated with a business degree from Arizona State and um, uh, met my wife shortly after college. We got married uh, in 2006 and then left in 2007 for 13 and a half years. Um, went to Seattle for four, four, of the four and a half years of those time and then spent the past nine and a half years in Burlington, Vermont and have been back in Tempe since December. All right. So what uh, what prompted the move back to Arizona? Well, we've been here. We, we wanted to enjoy uh, the weather. <laughs> That's a big <laughs> part of it. We want to enjoy the weather and um, have our kids in school. Uh, COVID's been very challenging for us, um, especially for our kids during this time. And um, having our kids um, on online school has been challenging for them as well. And so um, m many of the districts here in Arizona have taken a more aggressive approach in having kids in school, which is, I think has been great. So being able to have our kids in school has been kind of a big part of us uh, being out here. Yeah. Yeah, I can, I can certainly understand that. I think, I think it's been hard for a lot of parents in a lot of different areas. Um, you know, one of the, the admin staff that works for Landon and I, um, Landon's in Las Vegas, and they've been more shut down there than mm -hmm. they have been here. And, you know, trying to be, to fulfill, trying to fill an administrative assistant position full-time from home with kids at home doing online school is not easy. Yeah. And, you know, obviously you've, you've got your business that you're running that you were trying to run from home and all those sorts of things. So uh, I certainly understand that. But one of the things that I know that's unique about Reconciled is the fact that you guys have been a completely remote workforce company from the beginning. So first, tell us a little bit about what Reconciled is and then talk about you know what it, what it's like to build a completely remote workforce company. Yeah, Rec reconciled. Um, I had the privilege of starting five and a half years ago in the fall of 2015. Um, it's a online accounting firm. That's what kind of what I describe it. We serve startups and small businesses across the country, and we are their online accounting office back office. Um, so if you're a startup, if you're an entrepreneur, you're a small business, and you don't want to have to uh, build or have an internal accounting department, you basically outsource it to our team. Um, we have now 50 employees that work from home in, in 10 states, and we serve hundreds of customers across the U.S., um, from California to Massachusetts. And, um, and we also have a few international customers as well, whether they're subsidiaries or parent companies of, of U.S. companies. Um, and so we provide you know bookkeeping, payroll services, financial statements, ARAP services, um, you name it, anything you would have an internal bookkeeper account to handle for you, as well as we introduced last year uh, business income tax services as well, or the annual income tax return. So um, that's reconciled. And, and I, you know, I had built reconciled from the beginning as a very flexible work from home arrangement for my team and started it in Burlington, Vermont, uh, where I, I spent the past, you know, nine and a half years. And then slowly grew out from there, uh, hiring employees in different states and very intentional about where we would hire employees from. Um, what I didn't know was we were prepared for when COVID, the pandemic would hit and um, thought in the beginning that maybe things would uh, rattle us as a business, but ended up growing the business to close to 70% last year. Um, so very dr dramatic growth for us. Um, and we've had similar kind of growth in previous years, but to have that on top of COVID and, and, you know, the one unique thing probably is dealing with children at home. You know, it was probably the one change my employees had was just children and their spouses being home, not which, sure which one they would rather have, yeah. <laughs> <but> <laughs> having them both home, uh, from the workplace. So that was, that was pretty wild, but we were prepared and we've, we've actually, um, coached and, and taught and spoken about 
how to build and launch um, a remote practice in the accounting industry. But then now we found ourselves actually teaching and kind of speaking with other business owners who are new at this idea of, of really growing a, a business remotely and online. Yeah, that's cool. So, so tell, let's dig in a little bit more. I mean, give us some of the things that you've done specifically to prepare yourself for, you know, building this remote workforce, right? You knew it was going to be remote from the get-go. You, you grew intentionally in certain areas because you knew that's where you wanted to expand. But what is it that you put in place specifically that can help other business owners that are contemplating potentially staying remote forever, you know? So what what are what are the different steps or operational processes that you put in place to to help with that? Yeah, well so the first the first thing I I really focused on was, you know, if you th- if you think about accounting services, that fits into the handful of services that traditionally business owners and even people just purchase locally most of the time. So if you think about your attorney, your accountant, your financial planner, your doctor, your um, your psychologist, these are generally services you you uh, you interact with locally because there's a level of trust that you want to have with that person and you'd like to know and like to be able to find that level of trust in your community. So in the beginning when I started Reconciled, I realized I was about to ask business owners across the country who would never see me face to face, never knew my, didn't know my background, didn't know who Reconciled was, didn't know who we my employees were. I had to figure out a way for them to learn how to trust us with some of the most important pieces of information in their life, right? The the keys, if you will, to their financial backbone as a business, um, which in, for most business owners is the largest wealth creator in their life, if there is a wealth creator. We were going to ask for the keys, right, in order to do our work. We're going to ask for access to bank accounts and credit cards and access to their accounting system and access to payroll documents and employee information. So I realized the first thing I had to do was figure out how to communicate with complete transparency a very clear vision for what Reconcile was trying to do, how we were trying to serve small businesses and entrepreneurs across the country, and how we were going to do it. So that was the first and foremost. And I did that by uh, building a very cheap $99 <laughs> website, <laughs> and, and but leveraging that website to communicate as much information as possible about who I was, what my background was, um, leveraging LinkedIn to communicate that as well, as well as all the other social media platforms, but being very clear about what does Reconciled do, who does it serve, um, and if, if entrepreneurs or small business owners related to that, that they could come and work with us. And then that poured into or spilled over into the sales process and, and then poured into the other processes of our company. But it really started with creating a very transparent message that said, this is what we're trying to do, and we're trying to do it a different way. We are not your local, down-the-street CPA firm or accounting firm that you are, you're, you're going to go meet in person. It just doesn't, it doesn't happen. That's not wh- how we were built. Um, and that really, really helped us because we began attracting online more and more and more and more customers who were open to the idea and had never tried it before um, but really wanted to interact with accounting services in a different way. Yeah. So one of the biggest things that uh, companies are facing today is how to track the efficiency of their employees or to track, you know, what it is they're doing during the day and making sure that efficiency stays where it's supposed to be. So are are there certain things that you've done as an organization from the get go to to kind of make sure that's reined in and, and doing what it's supposed to be? Yeah, so, so you know, one of the values that we have as an organization is because we're trying to be completely transparent in order to build quick trust with our customers, we also have the same expectation and responsibility with our employees. And so we communicate in our hiring process and when we hire people and have them come on is that there is a lot of trust we're putting into people because not only are we asking them to be trustworthy – in regards to their time and discipline with their time while they work from home and not to be distracted by, by other things that would, would prevent them from, from being um, successful at their job. Uh, we're also asking them to be fiduciaries and trustworthy with the information that we handle because we're handling financial information, accounting information of, of, of people, of people out there. And uh, this information is, the, is central, the central piece of their success as a business owner or as an entrepreneur. So it was really important, and that, and that value or that trust starts in the very beginning with every employee. 
And then we set up our systems. Um, everything's everything's cloud based, and we set up our systems to where all the remote access um, is secured and shared securely through file through um, you know credential sharing systems. Um, and and then all our communication internally is securely done as well. And we leverage tools like Slack, Zoom, G Suite. We leverage all the online tools in order to communicate effectively, efficiently, but also to try to recreate what we're not getting internally in an office. And so, if you can take, if you can think about all the interactions that happen physically in an office, all the verbal and nonverbal cues that happen in an office, we take those for things for granted. And when you now work from home and your whole team is working from home, you realize, oh wow, I can't see the nonverbal cue of Ken in that email or in that conversation. I need to figure out a way to see them, but I also need to figure out a way to quickly communicate questions and answers as well. So there's different forms of communication you have to impl implement, like a Slack or internal messaging tool, like Zoom or video messaging tool, like email, and you have to be very clear with your employees of when, and when to use them and how to use them, and when is it efficient to use each specific type of communication platform. Um, and, and you model that as a leadership team, and you model that as, as a management team for, for your team. And so that really helps. And then we also have a time tracking tool we use where we don't have people clock in and out, you know, when they start their day. It's more of tracking time against uh, work they're doing just to make sure that um, we're pricing customers right and we're also serving customers in an efficient manner. Yeah. No, I think that y you hit a couple of important points. One, the technology has existed for a while. It's not been adopted by most companies, mm -hmm. right? Um, and so you, you saw an opportunity early on to say, gosh, you know what, we could actually do this a little bit more efficiently and we can expand our market, right? So me, myself, I mean, you mentioned financial planner, you typically hire somebody locally, mm -hmm. right? I have clients in 14 states, now 15, I just added a new state in the, in the past week and, and a lot of it, of that expansion has to do with this pandemic and us adopting certain things, right? I mean, I've onboarded new clients in the past year that I've never met face to face, mm -hmm. and that's a first for me after 20 years. The technology always existed. I just I thought that I needed to be face to face with somebody to build that trust the way that you said, and I've learned over the past year that that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. And we are now expanding and have a a plan in place. So Landon and I are merging our practices into one practice, and we do have a plan in place to expand our footprint even further and basically say th the whole United States is open for backbone planning partners. And it's companies like you that just, ca I'm kind of in awe and realizing, and you saying, gosh, it doesn't have to be this way, right? right? Yeah, they're sharing financial information, but so what? There, there are tools in place to make it secure and to build that trust in, in other ways. Right. The Oh, go ahead. You know, I was just saying, there's, yeah, there's, there's a lot of assumptions that we all have about our business practices, no matter what industry you're in. And those are assumptions um, are are limiting factors, right? They they provide limitations on imagination on what is possible. And so, you know, just like you said, you probably never imagined being able to take over the uh, asset management and planning of a high net worth individual without having meeting them face to face. Yeah. I mean, that idea is really weird, right? In financial planning and financial services, but it shouldn't be strange. The technology is there. Uh, the internet's been here for enough time now, um, people are interacting and, and doing very large volumes of business exchanges all the time online. Uh, why are these traditional industries that we think are uh, need to be done in person, why do we have that assumption or limiting factor anymore? Even medical services now can be done remotely. Yeah. Most, you know, Think about most of the medical services you receive anyways. It's a doctor coming in for five minutes looking at an arm that you have a scratch on or taking your temperature and then giving you an answer back. Well, my experience on, on tel telemedicine happened during COVID. I did a multiple check-ins with my kids, and they were prescribed medication via via uh, uh, the iPhone. Yeah, and it's go you're going whoa, this this was the experience. This was so fast, so convenient. No long you know no longer waiting in a waiting room or an urgent care or emergency room for a very simple you know very simple prescription that would have taken us hours at a doctor's office to get. So there are, you know, there's, there's all these types of services and products, I think, that we can now consume and, and engage with that uh, COVID and pandemic has obviously, obviously helped people remove those assumptions from their minds or those limiting factors from their minds. Yeah, I mean, honestly, I almost kicked myself thinking what my practice could have been <laughs> if I had adopted that as early, you know, 
as I could have. Now, you know, I started in the year 2000. The internet existed, but it wasn't what it is today, Mm -hmm. right? The tools didn't exist the way that they do today. But gosh, maybe 10 years ago, seven years ago at the, at the minimum, I could have started to adopt some of these things and, and have been more efficient than I am. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that you said that kind of stuck out to me was, you know, communication and using the right tools the right way and at the right time, right? So I, I, I found that I communicate way more directly than my wife does, mm-hmm. right? And, and she and I have been in charge of kind of this um, uh, what food drive in, in the town of Gilbert, right? So working with the United Food Bank and trying to get a bunch of food donated this, this coming week. And so we've had to communicate certain things. And my wife communicated some things, and then some questions came back, and, and she wasn't quite as clear as maybe she could have been. But then when I sent the, the communication back to say, no, look, you're overcomplicating this. Here's the information. It, it's pretty simple. I had to caveat that email at the end and say, I want to be clear. Tone cannot be read in email. <laughs> I'm not mad. I'm not, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm just making sure that things are more clear and I, I speak more directly or communicate more directly than my wife does. And so, you know, th- those are issues. They yep. become issues in a business setting. And so that kind of leads me to my next question is businesses spend years, traditional businesses, even it, with everybody in the same office, trying to build a great culture. Right. So talk to us about how you, what you do specifically to build a great culture inside of Reconciled, even though everybody's been remote all along. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, and that's actually the number one question uh, people, people tell me when they, when they talk about, well, we can't, we can't really go remote or work remotely because we're trying to build a culture. And, 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 and it's like this really big assumption, like, well, am I not <laughs> as a business? <laughs> like, every business has a culture, whether you're intentionally or unintentionally building it, right? A culture is formed. And what is culture? Culture is really formed by a set of behaviors. It's defined by a set of behaviors and the shared vision the shared vision and values of the organization. And so the, the thing we did with Reconciled is I sat down and kind of codified it on, a, on paper and – we wrote down very clearly and articulately what is our vision, what is our mission, what are the values of organization, and then we wrote down what we call family rules or team rules, and it's basically a set of behaviors of what does it look like, what does it look like for the ideal or perfect employee at Reconciled um, to behave or act or operate in their every day, every week, every month, right? What does that look like? And so we put those things down on paper, and we shared them with all the employees, and we talk about them, and we filter our performance reviews through them, and we talk about them in every staff meeting, and we um, and we model what it looks like as a management team, and we, you know, we applaud people who are successful at at living at living these things out, um, and so, you know, to think that just because you're physically in an office, a certain kind of culture is more positive or better than when you're not in an office, um, that's just that's just not the case. It really is a matter of how are you communicating the um, how are you communicating your culture? How are you living it out and modeling it for each other? And what are the modes and means in, of communication in which you're you're doing that? And then are you living that s- the, the same values and and behaviors out in front of your employees, in front in front of your customers, in front of the your vendors, in front of all the relationships that surround you? But first, sitting down and articulating it, and then constantly communicating it. And one thing I tell talk about in remote work is what would normally s- feel like over communication in, in an office is normal communication in remote work. So communicating important things like HR updates through all mediums so that everyone makes sure they see it, see it right? Whereas you might uh, communicate an important, announce, um, important announcement at, a, at an in-person staff gathering, and anybody that misses it, they're going to miss that big announcement. Well, in remote work, you're going to report it at a staff meeting on video, you're going to do a video recording and send it out, you're going to do a newsletter update, you're going to do a Slack post, you're going to do a text message to all the employees, you're going to do the multiple streams of inf- communication because you really want to hit, um, hone in that this is an important topic, right, an important update. But for remote work, that's the way, that's the way you're going to be able to overcome or compensate what you're missing in regards to the nonverbal cues that happen in an office. And then, like you said, you also need to put expectations of, hey, email is not a great form to communicate emotion. <laughs> it's not a good <laughs> form to assume emotion either of other people. Um, so you may need to get on the phone. You may need to do a video call. You may need to send a quick message and schedule uh, some kind of 
a meeting where you can see them on video and you can see the inflections as they communicate. You can see their emotions. Yep. Um, and will you always, will you ever be able to replace in person um, in person meetings? No, it's not complete replacement, um, but you can get pretty close um, as long as you're you're using the communication meetings intentionally. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think one could even argue that the over communication that you mentioned and, you know, recording the video and sending it out and, you know, sending out the announcement via the Slack channel, all those sorts of things. Even if you're in a traditional office setting and you did have an all hands meeting mm -hmm. where you put something out there, there's no reason to not also right. put it out that other way. Right? right. And so, you know, the biggest lesson that I learned is that, you know, culture is not about being in person. No. It's about being intentional with what your plan is. Yes. And then ev you obviously, as the leader, living it, but making sure that it's filtering down the way that it should so that that culture does emanate throughout the entire organization. Yeah, and, and culture also is defined by what you as leadership and management are willing to put up with. So it's all the, the, then the negative end is, are you willing to put up with um, in intentionally hostile employees? Well, if you are, then your culture is being defined by, we put up with hostile employees. Yeah. Right? If you're kind of culture that says no, there is no there is no grace period for um, you know for inappropriate actions by employees or by actions that um, are intentionally rude or mean or 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 offensive. If your culture says no, that there's no place for that here, um, then then you're sh saying to the rest of your employees, hey, we are not an environment that allows hostile uh, behavior to exist. We're an environment that cultivates inclusivity and cultivates a safe environment. So it's it's there's the positive side of what you want to build, and then there's a negative side of well, what will you what will you actually have accountability around? And that speaks a lot louder, especially as leaders, um, when you act quickly on on things that you know the rest of the team, the rest of your company can see. When you act decisively and um, you act confidently on that, then it helps kind of set a bar and also an environment um, of of this is what this is this is how important culture is, and this is how important um, we're stressing that these values are for us. Um, so that's you know that's an important piece of it as well. And so that's going to be even more intentional over over remote you know over remote teams and over yeah. remote work because they're they're gonna um, if you think about like the average week. Let's say that now your employees working from home or your teams are working from home. In an office, they may have been used to five hours of that week on in-person meetings, and then the other five are just indirect interactions at the at the water cooler, getting coffee, going out for lunch, and then the rest is work. But even in that work, there's banter, there's quick questions, there's gossip, there's jokes. All of that's gone. Yeah. Now you have five hours of remote Zoom meetings. Or Google Meet meetings, and then you have some Slack interactions, and that's it. So, if you don't f if you don't inform, and you don't communicate what's going on, your team will make assumptions. They will assume a lot of different things, and a lot of the times it's wrong. Yeah. <laughs> they will assume things like, "Oh, the boss, the CEO, he's out there traveling, just having fun, doesn't care about us," or. Or wow, they're asking they're asking for a lot from us while we're working from. Don't they know that my kids are home and we're doing school? And why aren't they being as flexible? All of those assumptions are running through your employees' minds. All of them. Yep. If you if you think it, they're pro they probably thought it five times that week. Yeah. And you've got to communicate. You've got to communicate the truth about what is it really that you're trying to do, and also that you as a leader are going through the same struggles. Right. We're not invincible. Uh, both of you and I, we're not invincible to kids being at home, spouses being at home. Um, technology not working sometimes <laughs> like yeah. those are all real things um, and so you you want to be able to share some of those things as well with the rest of your employees and your team yeah yeah I think it you know it's it's definitely got to be more intentional and one could say that it is more difficult mm -hmm. right um, but uh, it's definitely not overcomable mm -hmm. if if that's even really a word right but you know the <laughs> it, it, I, it makes me think when you were talking, I thought about, you know, the boss who says my door is always open. Right. <laughs> and then walks in his office and closes the door. Right. right? And so you, you've got to you've got to mimic those behavior or not mimic those behaviors, but model those behaviors for your employees in everything that you do or they mm -hmm. aren't they aren't going to catch on. And it really is just about 
changing the way that you do things, right? Because like you said, there's no more banter right there over the cubicle wall or, you know, through the office wall or whatever the case may be. Um, but that sort of thing could still happen through a private Slack message or, you know, instant message or whatever. So there is still the way to have that type of interaction with people, but it's just it's just different. We have to adjust. Yeah, and, and what, we've, what we've done is I've intentionally put on my calendar things like coffee hours with the CEO. Right, so it's an open. It's a literally set time every week. Anybody can jump on it in any part of the company. I'm gonna have coffee. If it's the morning, you're probably having coffee. Come jump on and say hi. Um, with key employees that have been around with the company, whether they report to me or not, if they've been around for a certain amount of time, I'm scheduling once every quarter just a 30 minute check in, and to say, hey, how you doing? I don't want to talk about work. Or if we are going to talk about work, it's me listening to you on how things are going and if you have any ideas that will make us better as a company. It's yeah. not me not me giving you feedback. You don't report to me. I'm not going to give you feedback on how you're doing. We're going to just talk. If there's any questions you have about me as a person, about my life, I want to know about your life. I want to know how your kids are doing. So it, it it's intentional spontaneity. That's no way, way where <laughs> yeah. you know normally you have spontaneity in the office. It's intentional. It's planned spontaneity. Um, and you know the, the way I liken it is, you know, when you're in a, when you're married, you know, you'd like to think that every single moment in marriage can be this spontaneous, passionate time. <laughs> and the reality <laughs> is, in marriage, you have to be intentional. You have to actually plan for passionate times, for times of, of interaction, for times of dates and in, in movie nights and times away from the kids. You have to plan for that. Yep. It, it just doesn't happen because yep. if it if it if you were waiting for it to just happen for a lot of couples, it just <laughs> will never happen. So they need to be intentional about it. Same thing with your interaction with your, your teams. You know, when you're remo- doing remote work, having those intentional times together are important because it shows that you care and it shows that you actually value them, knowing that your calendar, your time is limited throughout the week. Yeah. yeah. And, and just like in your personal relationships, the more, you know, the first kid arrives, it be, you've got to yeah. be more intentional. Yeah. Second kid arrive, even more, right? Yeah. Same thing with the employees. Yeah. You get to 10 employees, more intentional. 20 employees, you know, it... it 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 takes an adjustment, mm-hmm. right? But it is it is doable, and there are ways to to get it done. So, tell us about the future of accounting services, uh, according to Michael Lee. <laughs> the future, yeah. <laughs> so there, uh, the accounting services are are having a, a huge transformation, um, and obviously the past year has done an additional transformation. It's accelerated some firms by five or ten years in regards to their technology transformation. Um, but what you know, what was considered a service that you had to, you know, work with Sally down the street or, or, or Bob the CPA in your community, now any entrepreneur, um, any business owner in the world can access the best accounting services across the world. So not only do they have the option of working with somebody in the U.S., they could use somebody in the Philippines, they could use somebody in India, they could choose an MBA-trained person in South America – if that's how, how, how they choose to want to interact and, and who they feel like is best for the challenge and the accounting issue that they're having with their, with their business. You know, accountants in the past year have been heavily more leveraged for, um, because of PPP loans and EIDL loans and all the stimulus. They've been heavily leveraged. And so I don't know a single accountant that's not overworked. They're yeah. all overworked. Where we're seeing the convergence is technologies come into play and created a lot of opportunity for um, what I would call tech-enabled services, allowed allowed accountants to provide the services that used to be more manual and now has allowed them to provide the services with, with a tech component and also with a better customer experience component. So at Reconciled, when we do onboarding of new customers, uh, we set them up on an online platform and it actually sends them reminders on the different documents or the different access points that we need. In the past, that might have been a phone call and a manual checklist you were mailed or emailed and you had to go through. Now it's it's it, it's a reminder. It's a ping. It's a text, right? Um, documents getting to us no longer are accounts having to accept shoe boxes at the end of the year from their clients, which I know a lot of accounts still do. Yeah. Um, we we leverage an app, right? We put a, an app on every single customer's uh, um, phone. We say, here's an app. We give you access. Anybody on your team can have access. You can d- you can take digital photos through this app of any documents to come to your office. If you remotely think it says anything about accounting, take a picture of it. We'll see it. We'll immediately see it on our end, and we can make a decision of where does this go or what next task uh, does this queue up for us in our workflow. So you're going to see a lot of accounting firms begin 
um, probably acting like software companies or thinking like software companies and, and thinking more in the workflow and process orientation. You're also going to you're going to see a see a convergence of HR and accounting um, melding and kind of PPP kind of forced some of that over the past year where even the stimulus was this idea around you're going to get money based off of payroll and whether if, if what people were classified as employees or independent contractors. So accounts had to get involved in thinking through that and now they're leveraging tools like payroll software systems and HRS systems in their accounting practice to provide as advisory services. So there's a huge transformation occurring um, and, and you're seeing traditional tax firms now get into the business of advising and actually doing bookkeeping and advising of their clients. So there's a whole transformation happening across the country and, and, and the world, and it's because of technology and it's because of the pace of change and the demand of small business owners of what they want, right? Yeah. What they want from their accountant now. It's a lot more than it was five or even 10 years ago. Yeah, I mean, I, I obviously I'm a small business owner, but in addition to that, as you know, I, I'm, I do financial planning for small businesses. And one of the biggest frustrations that I've had basically my entire career in interacting with CPA firms is that so many of them on their website, it says we do tax planning and, you know, we, right. we provide advice, but they're really just tax preparers, most of right. them, right? Maybe they have a bookkeeping arm that does, you know, does some sort of bookkeeping there, but they're really just, like you said, getting that shoebox of information. They're filing quarterly returns or, you know, those sorts of things, but it's, it's really just that. It's not giving any sort of advice ahead of time to plan for certain things, choosing the right entity type or any of those, you know, things that they should be advising on or that the business owner believes that they're getting advice on a lot of the times, but they're, they're not. And so what I take from what you're saying is that potentially with this software and the technology that exists, maybe they can uh, streamline the tax mm -hmm. preparation services and the bookkeeping services to where they do have the available time to work on advice and planning. Is that fair right, to say? Right, right. And, and, and I would say, too, there's, there's, there's a whole generation of accounting owners and accounting professionals who want – and realize that their clients want this and want to stay relevant. And there is a whole generation of retiring accounting professionals where that they may ch not change over the next few years as they retire, but the, the new breed of accounting professionals and, and more pioneering ones that are more tech forward, that are more about doing less of the, the historical and data entry work and more about advising, you're going to see more and more of that. And frankly, that's where the market's going. That's the demand small business owners and entrepreneurs have is they want more forward thinking and more forward planning and less looking at the past. And a lot of times accounting has been about the past and traditionally been about the past. Yeah. And it's being forced to think about the future and forced to think about how fast can it help a small business owner move. And some Because in the past, when you were thinking about the past, um, because of the speed of change in previously, it was okay that you, you, you maybe spoke with your accountant two weeks into the month when it was over. But now it's like you need to speak to your accountant the next day <laughs> or the next hour. You need to know information right away if you want to keep up with the speed, the pace of change and the, the, cha the speed that the economy is going. And if you're in a very highly competitive industry, you can't wait that long to make decisions. So, so that's what's happening, and, and I think that you know, you're going to see more and more firms like Reconciled starting and instead of becoming kind of the minority of the industry becoming the a, 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 a majority of what the industry has to offer yeah yeah i, I honestly i hope so because it, it it's it's a big frustration with what i do i mean a, a client a specifically a business owner should feel like they should be calling their accountant before they make certain decisions mm -hmm. and most of them don't because they're just used to the accountant dealing with whatever they did after the fact mm -hmm. right and everybody's going to be better off if the advice is sought ahead of time and plans are put in place to either make it more efficient or offset some taxes or delay or, you know, whatever is possible from a planning standpoint. Um, it, the client will be better off rather than after the fact going, oh, you sold $4 million worth of stock <laughs> in, you know, last month. I, I mean, did we have a plan for that? Did we right. talk about capital gains? Did we talk about opportunities to offset any of that? You know, it's... It's just not something that is being done as frequently as it should be, and I hope it does help to make that happen more going forward. Oh yeah, def definitely. I, I think I think that's a reality. You're seeing it in financial planning. You're seeing it in your industry. Uh, 
of what customers want and, and more and more accounting firms are seeing it as well. And it's gonna, it's, I think the major shift is, has been happening and it's gonna continue to happen over the next few years. Yeah. yeah. So accounting aside, uh, we haven't talked about your other company, Sazable, right? Yeah. So maybe we can talk a little bit about that and you can tie that into what you see as the future of FinTech overall and small business as we go forward. Yeah, so S Sazable was born um, out of my experience working with a lot of startups, a lot of small businesses, and especially in the the accounting software ecosystems that um, that have been building over the past 10, 15 years. And, you know, traditionally in the past, accounting system data w was housed on somebody's laptop or desktop or a server. And it was very hard to access, and so usually the accountant accessed it, and they were the ones that were doing... Um, data entry work into that system and doing all the accounting work for your business. Now that everything's in the cloud and everything is moving towards the cloud, there's access to a lot of information sitting in accounting software. And so the so we, we launched Sazable uh, a year ago, uh, my business partner and I for Sazable. We launched it first um, to, s to develop a, a tool, an app, that would make it really easy to start capturing some of the data out of accounting systems so that a business owner can see more of a dashboard view of the metrics of their business. And so we, we first targeted companies with recurring revenue business models, so SaaS companies, subscription bot companies, anybody that had a recurring revenue business model. Uh, we wanted to focus on providing them the metrics in a very simple and easy to use fashion um, that would replace needing Excel or Google Sheets. And that's how Sazable was born. And so. Um, so Sazable was launched last summer, the product. We launched it in the QuickBooks Online store, and then the, uh, the Zero store is being launched here in the next couple weeks. Um, and really, anybody can go online at getsazable.com and try it out. If you have a recurring revenue business, you can use it, and it attaches to your QuickBooks file and reports to you those metrics. And so the future of fintech is really leveraging this data, right? We're going to see more and more fintechs. They're already doing it now, and we're going to see more and more industries accessing it where now that you know you have access to uh, live accounting data and financial data that's sitting in accounting systems on the internet and that a customer, a small business owner, can give you permission to access it, you're already seeing, you're already seeing fintechs like ClearBank, PayPal, uh, Amazon, eBay, right, and certain online banks starting to access the information um, for their fintech processing and for their loan application processing and for um, you name it, whatever interaction they want, instead of providing them a upload of a PDF and a tax return and a manual application, you're seeing them just access the data right from the source, from yep. the accounting system. So that's, we, I think, the future. The future of fintech is going to be leveraging more and more cloud-based data from multiple different sources, point-of-sale systems, online shopping carts, accounting systems, um, and there are going to be a lot of use cases that are going to be that are going to be created to be less frictionless for us as as consumers, us as business owners. Um, you know, last time I don't know if the last time you went to for a business loan at a bank or at anywhere, you know, most banks are still giving you a PDF to fill out <laughs> and yep. wanting you wanting you to bring in paper documents. Why? Why is that the case? Yeah. That shouldn't be the case. Um, so there's going to be a future where more and more of this data is accessible and, and in real time, and that's what's happening right now with a lot of fintechs. Yeah, I think it's great. I mean, it's a financial planning software that I use does that sort of aggregation, and they can tie all their accounts in whether I manage them or not, right? Um, and regardless, it gives me the info that I need to really advise them properly anyhow. Um, for my most recent refinance, same thing. I connected my bank account, mm -hmm. my, my retirement account, my investment accounts, and it all just flowed through so that they had access to pull what they needed so that I'm not downloading six months <laughs> worth of bank <laughs> statements or whatever and sending it to them. It's it's a pain in the neck, and it just makes it that much easier to say, oh, I can connect this, and they send you the, the, duo, you know, the dual authentication and all that so that you're approving it. They know it's you, and it's yeah. safe, it's secure. And most of, that, most of that transformation has occurred on the personal finance side, so talking about mortgage application, personal finance, personal financial planning. There's still a lot of innovation that has to happen on the small business side, and it's, yeah. it's really pretty much an underserved market. And so what you've first seen in the fintech world is – You've seen basically the equivalent of payday lending, advanced merchant cash lending. You've seen introduced in the small business world because there's no regulation right now. And that's what a lot of online fintechs have done is introduce this concept of quick, quick lines of credit, quick term loans for your small business. 
um, when really they're cash advances. They're really merchant yeah. loans. They're really you know high, very high cost, very high con highly convenient loans. Yep. Hopefully, the traditional players like the banks and the markets um, catch on and realize they can access the same data, but they can do it to the benefit of the consumer. They can do it with for with the more cost affordable. Uh, uh, products that they're able to offer as a bank or a traditional bank. Um, so that, but that ch transformation will take some time, but it, it, it'll be accelerate here pretty quickly. And if if a bank or a local lender doesn't keep updated on, on this, they're going to be irrelevant in a matter of five to ten years because most of us are going to expect to be able to experience <laughs> interacting with them like that and, uh, in regards to the you know, most updated way, just like you described with your mortgage refinance or your personal financial planning. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. I do. I do remember multiple times logging into my merchant account with a side business that I have, as well as QuickBooks at one point, where you log in and right on the dashboard mm -hmm. it says you're pre-qualified for a certain amount, yeah. and you know, no mention really. It's just this much, this flat amount. Uh -huh. Will you pay it back in six months or ninety days or twelve months or whatever? And and, and if you do the math and you figure out the APR on that, it's it's pretty high. Mm -hmm. And so it would be different in in the bank lending situation if they had access to the same data because that's why QuickBooks is doing it. They're seeing your right. books. They know what's going on and they say, this is a good bet for us. They can handle it from a cash flow standpoint. We're good with the numbers. Let's go ahead and offer it to them. Right. And as a business owner, it's easy. You can have the money in your account the next day. And so, yeah, I can see how it, how it works and why it works. But you're right. The, the traditional banks need to get involved um, or the process needs to change completely mm -hmm. to where banks are involved and in bed quote quote unquote with quickbooks or some of the other online accounting softwares to help facilitate it yeah yeah well i've appreciated the conversation i think great. that uh you know you and i've known each other for a few months now we've gotten to know each other a bit through vistage um but i learned more about your business today and and just more about your approach to things and i've i've appreciated the conversation and your willingness to come in great thanks austin thanks for having me on yeah thank you You've been listening to Tycoons of Small Biz, proudly hosted by Austin Peterson and Landon Mance. Austin and Landon are comprehensive financial planning professionals specializing in financial, estate, and succession planning for small business owners. Austin and Landon have offices in Scottsdale, Arizona, and Las Vegas, Nevada, and represent clients in 14 states throughout the country. Join Austin, Landon, and the Featured Tycoons live every Tuesday at 1 p.m. right here on Business Radio X and your favorite podcast.